What's up, peers? I am Max Hillebrand, and I welcome you to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. On today's episode, uh, we are joined by the one and only Adam Gibson, Waxwing. Uh, he is one of the peers who truly has found a, a deep understanding uh, of well f- physics and mathematics and Bitcoin. But even more interestingly, he has developed a a toot skill of explaining the nuances in these sciences. Uh, and it was an absolute wonder to to sit down again and talk to him uh, about, well, uh, first of all, his his background as being a teacher uh, in physics and mathematics uh, and and why he actually got interested to, well, study the science of the universe. Uh, and we get into some quite deep rabbit holes of quantum mechanics uh, and cryptography that are very, very insightful, at least they were for me. Uh, but ultimately, we talk about his motivation to develop and work on free software projects, specifically, of course, in the Bitcoin privacy space. As you all might know, uh, Waxwing is one of the core contributors to the incredibly beautiful and very smart join market uh, software. This is a market finding process uh, to coordinate coin join liquidity. Uh, it has genius economical insights at its premise. And it has been pioneering the advancement of privacy in the Bitcoin network since 2015. Uh, Adam is an absolute hero of the Bitcoin development. And I'm proud to, to sit down with him and, and share this conversation with you. So, Pierce, without any further ado, let's get into this show of Join the Wasabi Cast. And don't forget, share, like, and subscribe. So, Adam, thank you very much for joining me today here. How are you? You're welcome and hello. I, I was always interested uh, because you have such a, well, first, a prolific understanding of a bunch of mathematics and Bitcoin, but also a superb skill of, of teaching it and articulating the knowledge that you've come by. Um, where does that come from? Um, well, well, thank you for the, for the compliment. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's only at best partially deserved, but, but thanks anyway. Uh, where did it come from? My, my background in education. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, Education uh, was a big part of my life uh, because after university and humming and hawing and thinking about doing a PhD and then deciding I couldn't really afford it, <laughs> I decided that I should do something. I, I naively decided I should do something for society, not realizing that <laughs> society is such a train wreck. <laughs> and so I thought, you know what, I'll be a teacher because I actually find like communicating and discussing these technical ideas uh, really interesting, but you know, specifically a teacher of like mathematics and physics, which were the subjects I studied at uh, university. Um, so it's interesting. Like, I probably like uh, personality-wise, I'm, I'm I'm probably not a good candidate for being a teacher. Um, there's a certain kind of, I don't know, it's kind of difficult to pin down. But there's a certain kind of charisma that that really good teachers have um, across right across the age range. You know, wh- whether it be younger kids or even up to university level, that there'll, there'll always be those lecturers and teachers you remember as someone like a bit special for you you know and i don't think i really had like the 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 makeup to be a really good teacher in that sense but the interesting thing about it i think is that over a period of years i i did get better at it and i sort of crafted and honed the skills somewhat um and especially in terms of like communicating abstract and technical ideas and it, I, I realized sort of towards the end of my, my career, uh, assuming it's finished, which I think it is, as a teacher of like mathematics that, you know, actually students really appreciate me now <laughs> because I'm actually, I've actually learned how to, how to do it. And it is not easy, um, to communicate these ideas. Uh, you, you develop like a whole new version of yourself almost for, for the classroom or for the lecture, you know, that you, you present ideas in that way and 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 how that's manifested as i've gotten into bitcoin is obviously not so much talks and things although i've done a couple here and there and i I like to think they were quite well received but you know they're not like famous or something but you know talks about things like um schnorr signatures and and coin join xt and stuff like that uh but mostly it's i've taken the form of like writing blog posts and trying to Trying to find a, the, the, the space that blog tries to occupy is, is not, um, it's not really a teacherly didactic blog so much. Well, it is, but it's, it's more like at the higher end or let's say the intermediate high end. So the people who, 
the typical audience is somebody like a developer, somebody who wants to learn some of the concepts behind the cryptographic primitives they're implementing or, or some of the, you know, difficult or tricky points. And I, I try and, I try and help people in that sort of intermediate area who aren't pro like professional cryptographers who would, you know, on the contrary, probably just find mistakes in what I said. But on the other hand, they're not, um, completely clueless. Like they know basic mathematics and they know algorithms and stuff. Uh, that was quite a long answer, but you see, this is, this is me being a teacher. You see, <laughs> I can just talk for I can just talk forever. You don't need to edit out the silence in my podcast. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. The, the teachers blabber and blabber and blabber. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, well, but you definitely have something valuable to share. Uh, so it's good that you do that. Um, why did you get interested in physics and mathematics originally? I mean, that goes back to something that I think most, not most, but I, I, I could reasonably say a lot of children have, which is a very natural uh, <clears throat> curiosity about the way the world works and, um, you know, where everything comes from. You know, it, often it's like almost like a cosmological interest. Like, well, well, what is this thing that we live in called the universe? You know, how does it, how does it work? Where does it come from? Uh, which obviously is not ultimately answerable, but you, you, you sort of approximate an answer with physics on the grandest scale. Um, and, but I think there's, there's kind of two, if you think about physics itself, there's kind of two angles that people come at it from. Some people are more like me on the sort of abstract, almost philosophical side, interested in it as, you know, what are the organizing principles of the universe and trying to solve mysteries of things like, you know, how planets, what, what the earth is, where it comes from. And then there's more, there's people who are more interested in, in, in machines and how, how to sort of function, how functionally to make things work. You know, the, I always remember this uh, amusing interaction in a classroom with a student. Like, I think it probably happened many times. Where, like, they'd say, "Oh, you're a physicist, so you you, you know how how a car works. You can you can fix my car." And it's like, uh, no, some physicists will be very very good at things like you know putting machines together, and other physicists are much more interested in thinking uh, deeper ideas and putting them in, on paper. So I was more the latter, which of course fits in with mathematics. You know, they're, they're very closely intertwined. At least some aspects of mathematics are closely intertwined with physics. Now, things like, you know, um, Einstein's theories of special and general relativity and, uh, to some extent, quantum mechanics as well were, were, were the things that really I got fairly obsessed over when younger and really studied a lot. Oh, interesting. Why the, why that interest in quantum physics? Well, I, it was, like I said, I was probably more interested in Einstein's theories of special and general relativity originally. But of course, as I went to university and stuff, and you know, you have to start studying first just basic quantum physics and then quantum mechanics. And, you know, eventually it turns into quantum field theory and stuff as well. But, uh, but the, of course, the fascinating thing about the whole quantum mechanics side of modern physics as opposed to the, um, relativity side, we, put it crudely you know the, the extensions to newton's laws via einstein's theories uh, but the fascinating thing about the, the quantum physics side of it is how deeply and profoundly philosophically difficult it is to understand or to come to any like consensus on the real meaning you know the um the collapse of the wave function concept the, the copenhagen interpretation and the and later on things like the many worlds interpretation um which by the way i'm a strong uh, whatever the opposite of proponent is, I, I don't like the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Well, let me, let me see, let me see if you can engage in this conversation as well instead of me talking. <laughs> Why do you think I might not like the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics? Oh, um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, do you remember what, you remember what it is, right? It's a fairly simple concept, I guess. Um, that, uh, or, well, I'm not sure how to summarize it as a single. Okay, so just like uh, summarize it succinctly would be that um, every uh, measurement, if, if if the issue is measurement, like we don't know why um, the measurement would collapse the wave function. Just give a crude example, like you know you've got this classic diffraction, uh, this slit experiment, and when there isn't a measurement, the electrons or the whatever they are form a, a diffused a wave diffusion pattern on the screen. But if you place a detector in one of the slits then you don't get a diffusion pattern. You get like point patterns because it's as if it's as if in observing it, you've collapsed the wave nature and you've, you've the, the probability wave has collapsed and only one outcome has actually happened. 
And that's obviously, well, I mean, I'm, I have ex- I've butchered that a little bit. It's a very complicated uh, or a very unintuitive thing to explain. But once you understand it, you immediately realize that you don't understand anything because it doesn't make any sense. And then people came up with, tried to come up with explanations. And one of the explanations was, well, at the moment of measurement, uh, the universe is splitting into different uh, branches. There is effectively an infinite multiverse. And every specific possible outcome is a different version of the universe and you're just choosing which one at that moment and i I don't like it because i mean that's again a slight butchering and these are things i haven't studied for decades but but the reason i didn't like that particular idea was because it didn't satisfy a specific criterion for science so i think this is interesting maybe i don't know what kind of things people are listening to this are interested in but you might find this interesting if you've never thought about it before but what makes a scientific theory scientific so Karl popper came up with this very I think, very genius way of defining good science. He said that uh, a scientific hypothesis or a theory, if you like, should uh, make predictions which are falsifiable and then are not falsified by experiment. So if I, if I hypothesize that um, uh, a flying spaghetti monster is hiding behind a moon of Jupiter so we can't see it, but is controlling all the actions of every individual on Earth, uh, that's a very interesting theory, but it can't be uh, discussed as a scientific theory because it doesn't make any predictions about what's going to happen in the future. And if, you know, if on the other hand, you make a slightly better theory that the flying spaghetti mon- monster will manifest itself in London on June the third, uh, June the twentieth, um, then that's a prediction that can be falsified. And if it turns out he doesn't, then it's been falsified, and the theory is weaker for that but if it makes a prediction if a theory makes a prediction which is not falsified it's stronger by by virtue of that a good example of that might be um einstein's general theory of relativity which seemed very abstract and weird when it came out was predicting things about on very large scales about gravitation and it predicted a very specific aspect of the way that mercury's orbit would be seen around the sun and of course, the problem with viewing Mercury's orbit around the sun is the sun is very uh, bright. <laughs> so it specifically required an, uh, an eclipse. And he, he wrote this, uh, I don't know which year it was, 1911 or something, and then 1913. I'm getting the years wrong. But there was some year, a couple of years later, when it was possible to observe this specific behavior of Mercury's uh, orbit around the sun because there was a solar eclipse in the, in the Arctic. And there was actually an expedition, including Sir Arthur Eddington, one of the famous physicists of the day, to go and actually re- make these observations uh, at the time of the eclipse, and it verified. It, in other words, it did not falsify what Einstein had predicted. So it made an, an unusual, surprising prediction about a specific aspect of. Okay, I'm going on, but you get the idea. So that's mm-hmm. a falsifiable prediction, which is not falsified. Thereby, the the theory or the hypothesis of general relativity is considered stronger or strengthened. Of course, you can never have perfect truth in any theory. It's not yet never, broken. Yeah, it's not yet broken. Exactly right. Uh, why the heck did I start talking about Popper? Um, oh, because of quantum mechanics. <laughs> Those are the reasons uh, that I love so, every much. <laughs> right. So the many world theory of uh, Hugh Everett III is, is to me a completely a waste of time because um, it makes absolutely zero predictions about behavior. And uh, I remember writing an essay at university, and my professor was just really angry with me and told me I was wrong. And but I, I, I couldn't. We just argued with each other because it makes no sense. There's, there's no prediction. It's a big problem in modern physics. I think there's now I'm really straying away from my knowledge field of knowledge here, but I think string theory has a similar problem where they have very elegant and beautiful mathematical models, but they don't make actual predictions about experiments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Then when you don't predict anything, then you can't verify it after the fact if the prediction was accurate or not. And yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and yeah, no, no, it's just interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, but but uh, then. So, are there other explanations for this quantum state that are not the multiverse explanation? Well, that's a, that's a very good counterpoint, I think, because uh, I'm really stretching into my memory here. But as, I remember being taught at university the, the sort of in quotes canonical or the not canonical, but the, the original like theory in quotes that was developed about this weird behavior was sometimes called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and it just basically says that when a measurement is made, the wave function, in quotes, collapses. So think of it as a, a wave of a, a probability distribution in space. Like a, a crude example would be like, 
where is an electron? Electrons are whizzing around an atom in, in our mental model, whizzing around the nucleus, but it isn't really in one particular place. It has this sort of wave of probability of being in any particular place, and there's a slightly more density of that wave near a certain region, so it's more likely to be in that region. But we don't actually know exactly where it is, and we have this concept of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that fundamentally you cannot know. But then there's this concept that somehow when you make a measurement of an object, it has to collapse and decide, in quotes, decide where it is out of all the possible locations uh, weighted by probability. It doesn't only apply to position, but that's an example of it. Um, so it's, if there isn't a good theory is my simple answer. I don't, I don't know a really good theory. I think it's, it's an ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. I've been playing cards quite a bit lately, um, and I've been thinking <laughs> about this because when, when a deck of cards is well shuffled, mm. nobody has yet observed the, the, the ah. order of the cards that are laying there, right? Yeah. And, and when you then draw a card, mm. well, um, only then do you observe it and it actually, you know, jumps out of that uh, quantum state into reality mm. of whatever that card is. Mm. Um, and now I was wondering, can we somehow manipulate the outcome uh, of that quantum jump before we have observed it? Uh, or in other words, if I if I think really, really hard to get the queen of hearts, <laughs> right. can that influence what card actually manifests? Yeah, I mean, it's the, only, the only thing that's popping into my head, I, I understand the question, it's kind of a fun question, but the only thing that's popping into my head is, of course, don't forget the... Um, Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. The whole point of that was that you would tie a fundamentally random quantum event, namely a nucleus decay, to the release of a poison that would kill the cat. And therefore, you can tie a macroscopic, you know, large scale uh, world event like a like a cat being alive or dead with a with a, a fundamentally sort of quantum level, tiny atomic level thing. And so we don't know now <sighs> applying it to. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm really not sure what to say about that. I mean, we don't know the state of the shuffling, but it's like uh, that's not the same sort of quality of uncertainty. I think perhaps this is the uh, I, I, yeah we're talking about something I haven't really investigated in many years. But as as far as I understand it, you're talking about a different quality of uncertainty. To, to give the example of again radioactive decay, if I put a um, a, a lump of I don't know uranium two three five or something. Uh, well, that's not a good example, but just just a lump of radioactive material that emits beta particles uh, on a desk, and I put a, a detector near it. I'm going to hear a click 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 right from the beta particles being emitted and being received by the detector, and the like rate or like let's say the distribution of times of the decay events are random, but they're random in a in a, in a kind of pure fundamental sense, in a way that the randomness of um, macroscopic events is not. Um, so, the, like, it's it's almost like as you move up the scale from atoms towards, you know, molecules and then microbes and tables and trees, you you lose that randomness in in noise. It's it's noise which smooths out. Um, so the macroscopic world doesn't fundamentally have that property of being fundamentally unpredictable in that way. It's, it's a tricky point, right? Because obviously matter is made out of atoms. So it seems like, but it's like the statistics is lost, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm, interesting. I know so, this is really non-trivial kind of questions, right? It's really like, yeah. yeah so it seems, unfortunately, I, I cannot manipulate the poker games uh, that easily. <laughs> I mean, it's. Tr I think it's true to like a, a one in a billion, 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 billionth extent. Like I remember my physics teacher way back when I was at school, the very first time he was explaining quantum theory to me, he was like saying, well, you know, this calculator which sits on this table could just suddenly fall through the table. Like quantum mechanics allows that as a possibility. Even that macroscopic object could be subject to... But he was th I think he might have been talking about quantum tunneling, the idea of you know, things which shouldn't get through barriers sometimes do get through barriers at an atomic level or a subatomic level. And he was saying the same thing could be true of something like a calculator sitting on a table, but it's just that the pr probabilities of it is just basically zero because, you know, each atom has a probability of moving, you know, a large, a much, much larger than expected distance for some, you know, for, for quantum reasons, so to speak, but it's not actually going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that helps or not. 
Well, I see, I see we're already deep down the rabbit hole of, of randomness <laughs> and probability. Uh, mm. is, is that also what sparked your interest in cryptography as a specific branch of mathematics? No, unfortunately, I didn't study cryptography at university uh, at all. Uh, um, I mean, my only memory of pre-Bitcoin cryptography really was just reading some popular accounts. Like there might have been a book called The Code Book by Simon Singh. Yeah, that's right. I remember reading that some some years. I don't know exactly when before Bitcoin. And um, I wasn't. Uh, I had no idea about cypherpunk. I had no idea. About, well, I suppose I do remember vaguely the stories about. No, I do remember. That's the only other memory I have actually of cryptography is to do with the the original crypto wars. You know the um, uh, this business about like when I had my first computers, I had like Windows ninety five and stuff. I noticed these messages about. I can't remember which program had it, but like a message about, oh, this is protected with a 40-bit <laughs> encryption key. And, you know, there was this thing about export cryptography. And it was sort of vaguely in my awareness that there was this issue about uh, cryptographic keys being treated as munitions. Um, but I didn't pursue it much. I sort of, like I said, I took a very vague uh, interest maybe i don't know early, early 2000s late late 90s in reading a little bit especially about this whole thing of rsa and how numbers can magically be used to you know protect secrets and, and it was interesting to read about but it was just very casual so it was bitcoin that introduced me to cryptography fundamentally yeah, yeah. that's interesting yeah it's, it's fascinating how bitcoin always um kind of picks up on on your existing baseline knowledge Right, where we're already somewhat familiar with, um, but then it throws you down in so many new areas that you've never really thought about or never really considered. Um, yeah, it just makes for a fascinating learning experience. Mm. So, so, but let's get back to the point of, of randomness and what that actually mm. is, right? Because it's so mm. powerful for Bitcoin. We always say we have random private keys, but mm. <laughs> what is that? What does that even mean? Well, that's that's wow. You're getting deep now. Yeah. So, I mean, I I I, I think maybe. We should just think of it as uh, entropy and unpredictability, right? Um, which is to say a lack of order. I don't know if people are aware of this way of defining randomness, but it's a very elegant elegant way of defining randomness is that... Uh, now, who wrote this book I read about this? I think it might have been somebody called David Kitin. I might have to look this up. C-H... AIT. No, that's, that's, no, that's like a, something in your skin, isn't it, Kaitin? <laughs> Whatever it is, there's this mathematician and he wrote a book which I found very entertaining and interesting to read. And one of the points he made was that you can define the randomness of strings by incompressibility. So, um, we're all familiar with the idea of like zipping files or maybe using, um, uh, what's the other one called? Um, what's it called? Tar, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, whatever. Let's say zip. So we can zip a file, um, and that's a, like an algorithm for compressing a file. Of course, what could it possibly be doing? Uh, it may be very sophisticated, but ultimately it's taking any patterning in the data and replacing patterned data with an encoding of that patterned data, right? So the trivial example is you have uh, the number 54, but then you have like 10 zeros before the number 54. And you can obviously compress that data by essentially removing all those 10 zeros before it or just writing 10 times zero instead of all 10 zeros. Uh, so there's, that's obviously the crudest example you could, you could think of as compressing data and it comes as a result of there being a pattern in it. So he defined, and I'm sure he wasn't the first one to come up with that definition, uh, the idea of... Um, uh, incompressibility as, as the definition of the randomness of, of data, uh, which really just means lack of pattern and lack of pattern is what leads, we hope to, um, to, um, unpredictability. So in other words, undeducibility by an, an attacker or an adversary. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just talking off the top of my head here. It's not really a topic I've really <laughs> prepared in any way. So maybe there's other things we could say. What do you think? Yeah, it's that aspect of it being a pattern or the absence of a pattern is, is interesting, right? Because humans love hmm. patterns and, and things <laughs> yeah. and these patterns always. Um, so if there's something that truly does not have a pattern, hmm. um, 
well, could could someone else have been, or could someone else have reproduced that, or or maybe the aspect of reproducibility also comes in, right? Which is maybe a spin on on it being a pattern. If someone else can reproduce the same outcome, um, then maybe it's not random. Yeah, I feel like yeah. So I I was thinking like yeah, the, you 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 mentioning about patterns is interesting. Yeah, and that tension between on the one hand. Right, that was all. So, if we if we sort of go back into history a little bit, I, I like I like to make this point. Although it's not purely about randomness, but randomness is part of it. If we look back into history, a lot of the things that we're looking at in cryptography are essentially about large numbers, and the the sort of mathematical properties we get from large numbers that we don't get from small numbers. Um, and the the in in a way, the, 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 the maybe the, the the central example of this is the factorization of primes. So I don't know if this is going to put people off, but it isn't that that complicated. But basically, you can think of every integer, every positive integer, to keep it simple, as something that can be expressed as a product, a multiple of several different prime numbers. Think of prime numbers as almost like the atoms of the integers. So when I say twenty one. You look at 21, you say, ah, oh, that's got a factor of 3, so it's 3 times 7, and that's it. Of course, you can also write 1 times 3 times 7, but that, that would not be very interesting. Um, so it's made up of, so to speak, two atoms, you know, the one atom of, of 3 and one atom of 7, or you could, you could have, uh, what's 21 times 3? 63. So you could have like, um, 3 times 3 times 7, 63. Which is made up of two atoms of three and one atom of seven, a bit like <laughs> water is made up of uh, two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Um, so every number is like that. It's a composite of, it's either a composite of different primes or it is itself a prime number on its own. And okay, this much is obvious. Um, at some point, I don't know when, uh, way back in history, I'm sure it was realized by people who use numbers a lot that actually going that doing that backwards process of finding the original in quotes atoms from the number itself can be very difficult um if you have a very large number uh, i can't I'll just i'll make up an example that i don't even know the answer to 1111 one, 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 1111 i don't actually know off the top of my head what the factors of that are or maybe if it's even prime it doesn't have a factor of 3 because it adds up to 4 uh, oh no, I'm going to start thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. <laughs> so it's, it's a number. Any, any large number, it's going to be difficult to figure out what those prime atoms are. Now, it's going to be especially difficult if you take some very, you know, human scale large number, like some number in the hundreds of thousands, something we can only barely work with without, you know, if we're working on pen and paper, it's going to be really hard to work with six digit numbers. Uh, and if we make it so that that six digit number is composed of two, reasonably large prime so you know something in the order of a few hundreds or a few thousands if it's just it has just two atoms which are these very large primes almost like heavy elements you know it's made out of uranium and i don't know einsteinium <laughs> one of these very rare elements it's going to be really really hard to go backwards from that big number and to find the individual prime constituents of it why is that process hard yeah good question um it's not that you can't do it, right? There's even like algorithms like this one called the sieve of Eratosthenes. And, and as the name suggests, it's just a question of sieving. You're, you're looking for, I mean, the way I would uh, do it if I didn't know any algorithms or I had any like programs or anything, I would just start by taking the square root of that number. That would be my first step. Because uh, if you think about it, the product of two numbers, uh, if they're the same, is their square, right? So, and you can, you can have one number be bigger than that and one number be smaller than that, but at least one of the numbers has to be less than the square root. So you're, you're sort of, as a detective looking for prime factors, you're, you're going to try and find the smaller factors first. You're going to do things like, oh, do the digits add up to three? Then it's got a factor of three. Uh, does it end with a zero? Then it's got a factor of 10. Does it end with a five or a zero? It's got a factor of five and so on and so on. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, simple algorithms you can use to find small factors. <clears throat> but it gets increasingly difficult. Okay, but to answer your question in a more concrete way than, than blethering on about algorithms that I don't even remember, uh, you're saying, why Why at a deep level is it hard? And I think there's a simple answer. is because fi primes are fundamentally random. The distribution of primes through the integers, it follows a kind of logarithmic scale where 
there are less and less primes uh, as you as you go up the, the scale, right? Obviously, like in the first ten, there's like what is it, six or seven primes, and in the first a hundred, there's like I don't know, seven, I don't even know, fifty primes. I've got no idea. But then it gets smaller and smaller proportionately to the total as you go up. In other words, it curves upwards, but on a on a slower and slower rate. So a logarithmic scale. It is literally logarithmic, by the way. Um, that's something that uh, was proved by I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so what's my point? But the distribution, like where exactly those primes are, is is fundamentally random. And I, I state that as an assertion, but I believe, and, and a mathematician will correct me here, but I believe that that statement is intimately tied with what's sometimes called the Riemann hypothesis, which is like the most famous unsolved problem in, math in mathematics. I think I'm right in saying that if that hypothesis is is correct, then the distribution of primes around this logarithmic scale is random. And everyone believes it is random, and, it, and the Riemann hypothesis is true, more or less, I think so. Uh, so what's my point? So my point is that because that's a fundamentally random distribution, it, you, can't re you can certainly be smart in the way you search for prime factors. Uh, there are cleverer and less clever ways to do it, but you can't fundamentally break through to that sort of, um, make a real sort of breakthrough that will allow you to find them quickly. Does that make sense? Kind of? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that's right. That's so interesting. Um, but you say that there's a difference between small numbers and large numbers. Yeah. So yeah, you, but my, my original point was that was that was that um, this is the the, 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 the the most obvious and the most important example. Because like say 200, 300 years ago, people knew this fact that it's difficult to um, factor a large number into, into its prime factors. Um, they didn't care. Why would they care? Because the only numbers they could deal with were kind of human scale numbers, like numbers of five digits, six digits. I mean, you know, certain clever people could do clever calculations, but it was no, there's no practical application for having numbers so large that it would be impossibly hard to factor. So it's like a, it's almost like a phase transition, except it's not, it's not like a water to ice phase transition in, in, in that it's not a, it's not a sudden transition, but or well, maybe it was a sudden transition in history because when computers came along, let's say in the early half of the 20th century, it suddenly became possible to deal with very large numbers, to actually use them in real calculations. And at that point, it was just a matter of time before certain people realized that this property that numbers have, that they're very difficult to break up if they're very large, like it's it's not an exponential growth. I mean, is it exponential? I don't know exactly how you scale it, but it's it's a huge increase in difficulty if you go from a four-digit number to a five-digit, ten-digit, or like in the case of RSA, you're talking about 300 digits in decimal representation. It, once you go to a very large scale of number, the, this process is not just correspondingly harder, but it's like exponentially harder. So instead of it taking... So if it, let's say it took you like uh, an hour to, to factor a six-digit number, uh, it wouldn't take you two hours to factor a, a 12 digit number, right? It was, it was like exponential. Um, again, I don't know the exact formulas or whatever. You get the general idea that once we've got these very large numbers, we've got things which asymmetrically, even given the same computing power to go backwards as we had to go forwards, um, we just, it's just no way in, in like the lifetime of the universe, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to, we're not going to factor that, that number. Uh, it's, it's asymmetrical is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, and that's why, as we started being able to deal with very large numbers, because of the advent of computers, fast computation, let's just say, um, this whole new vista, this whole new field of of, uh, of possibilities opened up. And, and, and what they turned out to be most important for fundamentally is this um, this idea of like m sort of military grade defense, or better than military grade defense, in the sense that uh, you're able to prevent people unlocking things that you've locked mathematically in a way that you couldn't do with an army or a, a gun, right? Or a safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating, right? That that you have some ciphertext, and mm. regardless how much computational power is being thrown at it, the probability of it being broken is just diminishingly small, right? Negligible. Mm. But I mean, the, the interesting point there is that even before we had this phase transition into, into effect, effectively, I'm talking about public key cryptography, even in secret key cryptography, we already had 
um, methods to create ciphertext, which is unbreakable, not only by a fast computer, but by any computer at all. Okay, so if we consider the example of the one-time pad, it doesn't really matter if you call it that or not. It's just basically secret key encryption where you XOR the data with a key or you add the data to a key modulo or something or whatever. It doesn't matter. There's a sim very simple operation, which means that the ciphertext created is uh, indistinguishable from random, as long as the original key was random. Um, and it's very interesting that even though that's like computationally or let's say theoretically much better than public key uh, crypto, uh, public key encryption, uh, it almost immediately got ditched as a method as soon as public key, well, at least at scale anyway. Well, once we had public key encryption, we used that and not this previous method, which is uh, theoretically better because it, it resists any level of computational attack. And the reason is because um, this previous method uh, required key material to be to be shared, and there are other problems with it as well. But basically, the the fact that key material had to be shared was was uh, was not not very practical. So it was only restricted to like military usage, as far as I understand, largely. Okay, so I'm I'm not sure why I get why an XOR algorithm is more secure, okay. even more okay. difficult to break than private public key. Okay, it is very simple to un understand. It's because it's because um, if I give you a cipher text and you don't know the key, um, the cipher text could correspond to literally any plain text, any possible plain text with the corresponding key. So just think of it as like addition and subtraction. Like I've got a key plus a plain text equals a cipher text. Well, if you don't know the key, if you've got the cipher text but you don't know the key, then because there's two variables, key and plain text, the plain text could be anything, and the key would be whatever the corresponding value is. Yeah, yeah, right. That there are so open it's, variables and one known. Yeah. And solve it, right? So the, the, there's like a trade-off here, right? What we do is we we use the, the this 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 sort of asymmetry, and if we're using RSA, we're using some specific asymmetry in numbers like prime factorization. To uh, we create a trade-off where we don't need the recipient to have the key. Which is this huge practical breakthrough, right? Because the recipient only needs the public key, not the sorry, the recipient. The sender only needs the 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 public key, right? And the recipient obviously needs his own private key. So because we've we've used that that huge practical advantage, but we've we've slightly given up one thing, which is this perfect uh, perfect security, and we've replaced it with a computational security. Because if anybody was able to factor that public key, uh. Am I remembering that right? Yeah, I think that's right. I can't remember the details of RSA, but anyway, if they can factor the key, then they can they can they can get the private key, and then they can decrypt anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, yeah, so so for like for a private public key, you you can reach the answer just by guessing, right? Uh, contrary to an XOR, yeah. where even when you guess, ah, uh, well. Yeah, it's possible even with even with XOR. Yeah, even with XOR, yeah. it's possible if you use what's a technique called cribbing. This was something that was used back in the day. Like, um, if you think, no, hang on, is that right? Uh, I think it depends. It probably depends on a lot of details. You know, I mean, both both of the systems we're we're just stupidly oversimplifying, right? Um, mm -hmm. You have to think about padding. You, you have many many different considerations involved here. But I, I just wanted to like focus on the mathematical aspect of it, which is that the the advent of public key cryptography is so profound, but it was, to me, I, I think, with very admittedly limited knowledge of history, but I, I think it was a direct consequence of the advent of fast computation. And whenever in history we had, we had invented computers, if it had been 200 years before or 200 years after, we would have very quickly after that invented public key cryptography because we would have realized this property of numbers, which was previously totally impractical, is now really useful. Um, yeah, wow, I think it's so. very interesting. I think it's, it's crazy what amount of advanced technology we can build on top of these basic primitives, right? Of private mm. public key cryptography. I yeah. mean, Bitcoin is a, is the prime use case or example for that, but the entire internet is basically. Uh, yeah, it is now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that that's inherent? Like, or you said that the creation of private public key cryptography is inherent in having fast computation. Um, but do you think that if you have like a wide communication network, as the internet is, hmm. that then private public key cryptography is also somewhat of a, a given, just because you want to whisper over the internet. 
I mean, sure, yeah, but I, yeah, for sure. And I, I certainly agree that if part of your point is that, um, well, it depends what, what point you're trying to make. You know, I'll, I'll let you speak. Yes, for, for sure, we need it for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking that even if you have these incredibly fast computation machines and they can talk to each other, um, mm. like, right. you know, if, if everyone reads every message, basically, mm. um, that's, that becomes a much less useful technology. Uh, so, yeah. And I'm just thinking that maybe there is another inherent linking here that if you have the ability to talk to everyone, then you will probably also want to have the ability to choose whom to talk to or to exclude mm. someone that you do not want to talk to. Yeah. 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 I see. I see your point. I mean, it's definitely, a, it was a, definitely another accelerant in making it more relevant. Um, yeah. Mm. Of course, the problem they had initially was, um, you know, the very early versions of this, like SSL one and so on problem they had was that uh, the performance problem because you know RSA intrinsically is because the interesting thing is the reason RSA is less performant and probably again somebody might criticize me for being inaccurate here but I think this is basically true the reason RSA is less performant than let's say elliptic curve cryptography is because uh, precisely because of the the algorithms that exist for factorization of numbers okay you have this this modulus this public key n and it's basically the product of two primes p and q and all you what you're trying to do if you're trying to break it is is find those those primes p and q um and because algorithms exist they're not fast enough let's say but they are not as slow as you'd like uh, to factor this these numbers uh, it means that to account for that you want to make that those keys very large and so rsa ends up being something done with very large keys i mean it started out with 10 24 bits and now that's not really secure at all and now it's 2048 and so on 4096 and um performance wise that was a real bottleneck especially in the early days you know computers were not really very good at doing those huge 300 digit <laughs> number calculations fast enough for real time communication. Uh, so it was fine for PGP, you know, back in the day when PGP was created, but it, it wasn't so fine for building a, a sort of secure layer of the internet. But one of the more interesting questions, if we, if we are, if we are talking about the sort of mathematical side of things is, well, why is it that elliptic curve, like the exactly corresponding operations using elliptic curves instead of RSA, why is it that they're allowed to use much smaller keys like 256 bits instead of, let's say, 2048 bits? Um, I'm not setting that as a quiz question because I only, I don't really know the answer myself. I got a sort of an intuition about it, but I'm not really sure. I think the answer is basically that, um, in a way, I think the answer is to do with, because I, I remember reading about this, that the, if you think of the group of elliptic curve points, it's kind of like a pure group. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's, it's a group, but it doesn't have, um, there's no such thing as, for example, uh, factoring numbers in those group elements. There's no structure. This is what I remember. I, I read this somewhere. There's no structure in it. Whereas, uh, in RSA, it's kind of a purer system, like the underlying mathematical system is much purer and simpler. It's just purely the integers. Um, then you use modulo, modular arithmetic, of course. Uh, but, but these numbers have like, there's some structure there. Um, I think that's what I read. And I, as you can tell from the way I'm speaking, I'm very, like, very vague about it indeed. Uh, but there's, there's this interesting counter argument. I remember having these discussions years ago with some friends. It's like, how well do we really trust elliptic curve cryptography? Because isn't it ultimately a lot more, I mean, I just said the opposite in a way, and I was talking about the group elements, but the whole like system is a lot more complicated than RSA, right? It's, it's, it's a much more sophisticated thing. So it's really hard to like delve in a sufficiently low level into the mathematics to properly understand like where these structures came from or things like the choice of curve is something that often bothers people like even people who are quite expert in the field often argue about that. Um, so it's like, it's definitely more efficient. Uh, that's not questionable, but it's more efficient because we've, we have theories which tell us that the key size can be much smaller. I think that's the primary reason so, it's more efficient, I think. Mean. 
So if we would have like 2048 bits of key size in ECDSA, hmm. uh, it, would it be as efficient or less efficient as RSA with the same key size? That's a good question. I think the answer is, um, oh, you're actually, you want a direct comparison. I can't give you a direct comparison. I'm trying to remember whether the particular like trick of um, sometimes called double and add or, 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 or um, square and add where you can basically you can do calculations in a kind of logarithmic number of steps instead of if I need to add a point to itself 5,000 times I don't need to do 5,000 operations uh, I can sort of jump but then I guess that's analogous to simply multiplying numbers um, honestly I don't know but I do think it's true, I'm pretty sure it's true, that the choice of key size is a consequence of the... Because people have done some very... I know for a fact people have done some very sophisticated analysis of like whether certain uh, techniques which can be used um, in like factoring primes can also be used in elliptic curves or vice versa. I'm trying to remember. There was this thing that Nigel Smart did. It was called what was it called? Because there's a technique called Pollard's row. Uh, oh, that's what I'm remembering. The, 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 there's a concept called uh, pairings, um, pairings cryptography, uh, and it involves basically doing this really weird operations on like multiple different elliptic curve groups at the same time. And the, the, the historical origin of this, this is by the way what's used in things like zk snark but the historical origin of where people even started looking at these pairings was because certain cryptographers came up with the idea that they could somehow reduce the, um, if I'm getting this the right way around, I think they, could, they, they, they figured out they could somehow reduce the security, um, or let's say the problem of, of finding a discrete logarithm problem for a certain elliptic curve. They could reduce it to like the equivalent factoring problem in a set of you know numbers instead of on on a curve so in other words kind of move it back to this rsa area and it, the idea was that if they could do that then they would have kind of broken the security because you know you've got too small of a key size right or something like that i'm sorry this is so confused in my head but but you but it's, it's it's just i'm just not enough expert on this in this area to give you like very explicit details um yeah. and yeah, somehow that didn't work so therefore therefore 256 bits is okay i don't remember the details sorry <laughs> or i don't really understand them either okay but but very interesting to hear all this um i, I have another question down here in the crypto rabbit hole mm. um you know quantum computers are oh, yeah. and at uh, calculating some things yeah um, and as far as i understand it they are efficient at um uh like breaking the elliptic curve um cryptography yeah uh, they are not much more efficient or at least not exponentially more efficient in mm. uh, doing the ha the hash algorithm yeah hash after 56 yeah now, why is that yeah i don't actually know about the second point other than that i know that the hash functions are essentially very complicated non-linear um sets of equations essentially uh so i haven't really investigated that side of it but i've heard the same as you on the on the side of um what was it uh, on the side of discrete log it's it's again that that thing that i was just saying that in some very vague sense the discrete log problem and, and the factoring problem are, are somewhat similar that they're sort of they're part of the same family if you like even if they're not operating on the same object and uh certainly i couldn't explain to you what the algorithm that quantum computers use uh, to speed up that factoring or that discrete log breaking but uh, I, I, I only know pretty much what you know. And I, like I say, the fact that it's kind of the same if you're looking at RSA or discrete log, that they're essentially broken by, what is it called? Shaw's algorithm, I think. Yeah, Shaw's algorithm. And like you say, with hash functions, there's some... I remember reading a document that seemed to argue that you effectively lose, so to, so to speak, half the bits of security. So, but you don't lose all of it or something like that but I, I don't really remember the details yeah mm -hmm. sorry i can't i clearly can't help you very much with these questions these are quite uh quite tricky ones mm. yeah yeah but but thanks for exploring them nevertheless it is very very fascinating i've like although i for sure don't have any advanced understanding of cryptography and it's rather counterintuitive 
I just find it very, very fascinating. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure why it is, but it's it's such an interesting field. Yeah, I think because it's, um, I think the novelty of it is 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 something special. You know, like the fact that uh, that these it's opening new ways of things, new ways in which things can happen that weren't possible before. Uh, and just from mathematics, that's somehow intriguing. That's that's something you don't often see in the world. Um, we see lots of new technologies, but we see it as some product of human ingenuity and energy cost and, uh, and you know, a little bit of mathematics sprinkled in here and there. But this is just like just mathematics completely changing society, which is almost a bit too weird, actually. Yeah, yeah right. And changing society at a rapid scale. Mm. I mean, go back just 50 years b before the advent of, of cryptography. A very, very, very different place, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm curious if we monkeys are, are set out to actually handle this <laughs> or if, if our brains will soon explode because it gets too crazy. <laughs> yeah, the, the gap between um, understanding and uh, like practical usage is quite alarming, really, isn't it? And I, I, I think I could apply that statement to myself as well as to people who don't study cryptography at all. Uh, you know, we, we are sort of monkeys with hand grenades here. We've, we've got these tools and, and we sort of stumble around with them. And half the time they don't do anything or they, they just kind of like, no, they, you have ideas that don't catch on or whatever. Uh, or you have an idea and it has like a flaw in it and then you realize, oops, that was a waste of time. But then there are things that people come up with and people start using it like within, <laughs> within a couple of years and they start putting things like money into it or even, or even just like, controlling their their website or, or some aspect of their personal sovereignty gets controlled by this weird cryptographic tool they don't understand at all how it works and so it's all just it all just feels very dangerous a lot of the time but it's kind of it's kind of tempting you know monkey looks at the hand grenade and he thinks this looks looks like a fun new fruit <laughs> let me see what let me see what happens if i if i pull this piece of metal out of the top of it you know let's let's have a look you know uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I guess, or where do you actually think that the term of don't roll your own crypto comes from? Uh, is it kind of like to discourage the monkey from going too crazy? Yeah, I, 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 I find myself wondering if it might have been uh, Bruce Schneier who came up with that, but it doesn't really matter who it was exactly. I mean, there's, um, there's, uh, there's a history and like a, a tension, isn't there, between the kind of industrial and especially governmental development of, of cryptography and this kind of uh, more renegade, you know, cypherpunk and or just random amateur cryptography tradition. Uh, obviously that branching happened with good reason around the same time as the advent of public key cryptography that we were earlier discussing, you know, in let's say the 1970s and into the 1980s. That's when it really kicked off. And, uh, you know, the, you had a flourishing of development of ideas in universities, but you also had little groups of people just starting to congregate on the internet like the cypherpunks who were just realizing that there's something here and that they there's no real way anyone can stop them doing whatever they want with it um so i forgot what you exactly asked though i'm ah yeah not rolling your own crypto so so then then you have people in that tension it's natural that phrases like that would arise and and you know, especially, I suppose, in the 90s when it started to become clear that this was going to get used not just in government departments or, or militaries, but it was going to get used in, in corporations and in, in, in the broader internet as it developed, uh, then you could see why that, that phrase would start to crop up because, um, this stuff is highly counterintuitive. Uh, uh, or maybe I should better say it's unintuitive, not counterintuitive. Like, there's a lot of things about the way cryptography works that you don't immediately see and it's very difficult to like analyze and critique your own algorithm if you've developed an algorithm it's it's essentially you need like other experts hopefully or at least other people to to sort of vet it and investigate it and, and look at it from an attacker's point of view because that's kind of very counter to human nature to sort of look at something as a as almost like a criminal or an attacker um, not many people have that skill so it's difficult to come up with these things. It's difficult to understand like intuitively how they work. It's difficult to understand how they might be attacked. So it's just overall a very fraught thing to come up with any kind of cryptographic algorithm. 
or, or one using cryptography. Um, so it's an entirely logical and sound sort of, uh, what's the word? Um, intention, um, behind that phrase, don't roll your own crypto. But of course, in, in, intrinsically, if you just take it at face value, it's not actually logical or correct, is it? Because so, somebody has to actually make things. Um, and if the implication is only a few members of a specific, you know, priest cast or you know, only the anointed by certain, you know, uh, university departments and or government departments are the only ones who are allowed to do this, then that's just obviously nonsense. Um, so there's a, there's some kind of tension there. On the one hand, it's clearly correct. And on the other hand, um, uh, it's clearly not advice that can be followed absolutely. I recommend, uh, I'm reminded of uh, Greg Maxwell's uh, talk on this topic, and he used the phrase, abstinence only cryptography to describe this attitude which i thought was very funny because <laughs> it was it was the idea of you know like there's some movement in maybe it was in the states you know to, to 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 argue that children you know should be taught abstinence only you know don't have sex before marriage under any circumstances and and this is you know it was laughed at because obviously it's not realistic you know you're not going to stop teenagers from doing what teenagers do um and so similarly he was saying like this is just like abstinence only cryptography you can't people have to use cryptography uh, people have to interact with it and to a, my, to a greater or lesser extent that involves coming up with algorithms or sub algorithms. You know, you're actually interacting with it. You can't pretend that every person who isn't like at the top of the university department is never going to make up their own algorithms. But on the other hand, you know, it is a valid point that it's an extremely dangerous and difficult thing to get involved in. So two sides. Yeah, at least when you roll your own crypto, ask a bunch of people if it actually does what you think it does. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's a probably a probably the best way to square the circle or to sort of uh, find the balance between the two points is to bear in mind that you have to be part of an interactive, uh, collaborative process, which is why those of us working in a more or less open source environment are in a much much better position, I think. Um, Whereas, you know, you, you get, get cases like, like the Telegram case where I have no idea what they were doing when they came up with their, their, their cryptography. And like a lot of experts in the field have just like torn their stuff to shreds saying this is just not. And the reason is a lot of the reason they're, they're tearing it to shreds is because there isn't any justification or explanation for many of the steps they take in their algorithms. Um, now maybe it'll be perfectly fine and maybe Telegram's crypto is absolutely perfect, but, uh, it sort of doesn't pass the smell test in a way. And also, you know, because it's all done in, you know, when these corporations do this stuff in-house, I always feel like that's that's not the way things should be done. It should be done in an open way. Yeah, yeah. As actually, speaking about the topic, um, yeah. when when did you first, like, realize what free software uh, is about? When did you first discover that part? Mm. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Because um, I'm not really sure which point in my life I should say, because the, the, my first interaction with, well, when I started playing around with like Unix, not Linux even, but Unix, uh, in one of my earlier roles as a nuclear engineer back in, well, I suppose I, I was on a Unix terminal in university as well, very briefly, but uh, my first kind of job as a nuclear engineer in 97, I want to say, um, was playing around with Unix. I got a bit familiar with the idea of Unix, which of course is not the same thing at all. Uh, but then I guess around 99, 2000, I think it was 2000, first got a copy of Linux. And I can only assume that I did that because I just thought the whole idea of like a, a free and open, it's not, it wasn't really about it being free monetarily, but just it being free in the other sense. Uh, operating system was really cool. And, and being somebody who'd, you know, dabbled with programming in various steps of my, of my life, I, I liked the idea it would give me a lot more sort of personal power as a user to control the computer so i got i got a copy of linux uh, and started using it i guess around the year 2000 it might have been a you know it might have been like 2002 actually and i think it was red hat if i remember right uh, but anyway I, I i played around with that for a year or two but then i went back into teaching and doing an ordinary job like that it was just like i can't be bothered messing around you know in those early days, well, early-ish days, Linux was, wasn't stupidly easy to use. I mean, there were a lot of like roadblocks in using different pieces of software. So I just went back to using Windows as, as I had an ordinary job and I just wanted to, you know, get on with my life, so to speak, rather than tinker with a computer all day. <laughs> um, 
and then I only sort of came back to Linux around the same time after after Bitcoin and after giving up my my last teaching job. I came back to uh, Linux because again I felt more like a free agent and I wanted to spend more time programming, and it just was natural to go back into Linux at that point. But open source software generally, I always understood vaguely the principle, even from the early days. I remember the shareware days, and I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, I guess late nineties that was. Um, I can't remember like whether I donated different things. It was more difficult to donate back then, <laughs> but I probably did donate to a couple of pieces of software. And then, yeah, and then after shareware, and it became more this whole open source thing. I definitely heard about that a lot more than I heard about cryptography. It was a lot more obscure in in the sort of those intervening years. And I was definitely on board with the concept, but it only became really easy to use Linux. I feel like in that in that late on that later time round when I, I got used using it again in 2013 i guess it was and then i was oh yeah this is actually pretty easy to use now there's still problems but it's you know and and of course i signed up with github and i started playing around with yeah, a couple of different software projects just messing around and um but yeah i was always bought into the idea from the first time i heard about it i think it's a very good idea yeah mm. yeah it seems very reasonable actually mm. and, um so what were some of the projects that you were tinkering on when you first got into Bitcoin? Yeah, so my first um, sort of thing I looked at was something called TLS Notary, which is not actually, ironically, Bitcoin at all, um, except it's just, it was the, me and some other people that I'd met online chatting on the Bitcoin talk forums, because, you know, back in those days, that's mainly where people talked. Although it started to sh shift to Reddit already uh, in late 2013, but but yeah, a couple of other people I met on there, and we were just like playing around with the idea of how do you like verify bank transfers so that you can make um, so you can make transactions, you know, buying and selling Bitcoin with well, like more more certainty. And we were sort of thinking about. I mean, it, it originated from looking at banks and saying, oh, well, if I want to make a trade, I need to somehow verify that I've actually made this bank transfer. I mean, it was very naive in a way, but. I, you know, I thought to myself, like, how do we, what, why isn't this digitally signed? Like, because, I, you know, that was the forefront of my mind, having recently understood Bitcoin's basic operation. Like, why wouldn't you digitally sign <laughs> uh, records from banks? And like, you, you can you can give them your public key or you can play around with it, but they won't actually sign your bank trans transaction records. And I sort of looked into terms of service and blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, that naturally led into the question, well, hang on, we're on the modern internet where everyone is using uh, encrypted communication, right? TLS or SSL, whatever you want to call it. So why can't we just use that functionality to verify that the, 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 the transaction records are real? Just, just to clear it up, I'm, what I'm saying is you can always make a screenshot or, a, or, or something like that of, of your bank transaction records. And, and some people might accept that, but it doesn't really prove anything. Um, so we were thinking about, well, how does TLS work? So this involved investigating TLS at some, at some detailed level and realizing that unfortunately in its natural state, it doesn't provide you with any sort of transferable proof that the material that you've received from, let's say your bank's website actually is, is genuine. And the reason it doesn't provide, um, uh, proof is because the secret key material, it actually goes back to the beginning of this or early part of this discussion, which is the difference between public and secret key cryptography, which is although public key cryptography is used in order to validate at the start of the interaction that the, the website you're talking to is exactly the website you think it is using digital signatures. Um, unfortunately, at that step, it switches into secret key, key cryptography. It takes that what happens is once you've established that connection, you generate secret key material between the two parties, which is then used to encrypt all the remaining conversation between the two parties. And so the problem there is because it's secret or let's better call it symmetric key cryptography, it means that both, both sides of the conversation have the same secret key material. And because they both have that secret key material, because I specifically as the client have the server's secret key material, I can forge any arbitrary number of uh, any data and, and say look this this was this came from the bank because i have the key that generates the correct encrypted record um so it's like a think of it as like an ephemeral setup encrypted communication you, you know that you're talking to the bank at that time you've established the keys but it's only between you and them 
you're not going to be able to take any of that data and prove that it, it, it belongs or it came from the bank to anyone else. So that, that's a long uh, explanation, but the end of, end of it, what happens is that me and these other two guys, we came up with an algorithm that um, kind of does some shenanigans with the key transfer in such a way that you could prove to a third party that actually actually this um, this conversation transcript, so to speak, between the client and the server is actually genuinely from the server because you cut, basically by kind of half withholding some of the key material at the beginning it's it's very complicated but there's a there's a pdf if you want to read it anyway it's all kind of historical because that that particular method no longer works because tls changed its algorithm in such a way that that specific way of doing it no longer works there are more modern attempts i believe there's a paper called deco d-e-c-o which i remember reading about a year year or, or, or two back where they've tried to extend the same concept uh, and use kind of more advanced mathematical techniques, let's just put it like that and keep it simple, to achieve the same goal, exactly the same goal, but using the modern versions of TLS, which have you know different um, algorithms. Uh, that's probably really difficult to understand. I'm sorry, I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think actually quite, quite reasonable. And it's interesting, right, that once you see Bitcoin and you look back to the fiat uh, incumbent system, yeah. <laughs> it's a joke. Right. Mm. There's just like so many design flaws that make building on top of it basically impossible. Yeah. I mean, sort of give us sort of wider scope and context. I mean, what I've just been talking about, even though at the time I thought it was just about bank transfers and, and I thought it was just about buying and selling Bitcoin, it actually ended up being about what is commonly known as the Oracle problem. And so as we've, we've had these new cryptocurrencies, especially Ethereum and then these other ones have been looking into like, oh, we want to somehow make, uh, we want to make a tie between the real world and the blockchain, right? And this idea, I mean, of course, we have the same thing in Bitcoin with DLCs and so on. But we want this idea that somehow we can verify in some objective way that this data coming from the outside world is actually real and therefore we can take some action in a smart contract. Um, so as far as I know, this DECO paper uh, has ended up being used uh, I don't actually know if it's been, I, I'm, I want to guess it hasn't actually been used, but people have been talking about using it for that kind of general application. Of course, it's still, it's still an interesting philosophical debate, isn't it? Like, um, okay, you know, you're now attesting, you've now got some clever cryptography attesting that this data, like, you know, the temperature is 10 degrees in Addis Ababa or whatever. <laughs> you're attesting to that, uh, and you're putting that in the blockchain, but you still got to trust that ultimately trust the public key that created that TLS session in the first place. So there's still this element of trust. So that's kind of dodgy, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. the root of trust goes uh, mm. deeper and deeper. And, 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 and you, you know what else is interesting? Is, this, is, this is the one that really like got me thinking. Is Suppose you've got a bank. Uh, it, could, it could be any other institution, but you've got a bank, and they don't digitally sign their, their bank statement. But you want to attest to it as, or, or use it as an attestation, as a proof to a third party and say, look, I definitely have that money or I definitely made that transfer. Do you have the ethical right to do what we did? Because essentially what we did is hack the system. We took the uh, normal TLS client server operation and we slightly modified it so that a third party was actually involved in the interaction, so to speak, behind the client. And the result of that was that the third party got a, got a, like a, an attestation on what the bank said, even though the original construction of the, inter the communication is such that the bank believes that what it is saying is repudiable. That is to say, it believes that whatever it's saying to me as the client is ephemeral and cannot be proved to ever have been said. Um, but if we introduce our little hack, then suddenly it is possible. It is it is not repudiable, at least to that third party. That third party now knows what was said, uh, modulo the trust in the private, uh, the public key of the bank, of course. Is that, an eth is that an ethical thing to do or not? Um, well, th does, the, th does the server find out that the hack is used, or is it completely obfuscated? I mean, if it's... I do remember us trying to make it as obfuscated as possible, trying to make it so that the bank wouldn't see. But of course, the bank is just running some software in the back end. They're not even going to be looking for this behavior. But let's just say for argument's sake that it's completely obfuscated and they, don't, they can't see it. You would say that that's unethical then, would you? 
Huh. I I actually would say so because if you look at it from a private property contract, right? Mm. There's a client and server going into a contract mm. um, under a specific protocol, and this protocol mm. defines that it's an ephemeral conversation, mm. right? And it's kind of like uh, you know taking screenshots from an encrypted conversation, right? When you right, previously, it's very similar, yeah. Yeah, when you previously like specifically agreed to the protocol mm. and said that you're going to follow it, right? Mm. Um, now the question is if if that you know if if the if this can already be you know, counted as as a private or a breaking in private property contracts because yeah. you, you broke that 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 protocol version mm. basically, um, I'm not sure. Mm. After all, it's just communication. Uh, but you know what? You're an asshole for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know what's really interesting about this is is even if you just put to one side whether you think that's ethical or not, the, the really interesting thing is. Notice that the effectiveness of the technique, if you just considered it part like a blue sky thinking, just imagine everyone's using this technique and does it work or not. Notice that the technique is much or is at least more effective precisely as a result of the bank not knowing it's happening. Because mm -hmm. the bank not knowing it's happening means that they're not biased in any way. You know, it's like the quantum measurement problem, right? We, we don't want to bias the measurement, right? So the measurement uh, of, let's say, my bank statement it doesn't matter what it is uh it, if the bank doesn't know that this particular action is happening then they're more likely to just well they, they have no reason to like change the content i know it's like a fairly minor in practice in practice it's not likely they change it either way but but it's really funny to me because it, it's that principle that i've sometimes talked about the, the steganographic principle again the idea that um your your defense is the fact that the other party doesn't know that you're actually using a defense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the defense that you're using might actually be quite weak, mm. um, but it's mm -hmm. enough because you're not under attack, right? because mm. you're under the radar. Yeah. So I don't know. Personally, I think the it's probably a bit of a stretch to call it an ethical violation, but I could I could see the argument and also... Uh, we should bear in mind that if you read the internet banking terms of service that most banks give people, which of course nobody ever reads them, but I did read some of them. They oh, my usually, condolences for having to go through that. <laughs> yeah, but usually, usually they say something very close in language to none of the information provided in these, you know, by this software is uh, how to how to say it. None, none of it is. We we do not stand behind any of it. Um, which I, I consider just to be completely outrageous because what they're saying is that if you, you know, engage in business and you find out that there was an error on the banking system and as a result you, you have some terrible financial loss, it's nothing to do with us. Basically, they're, they're not standing behind anything they put on those bank records anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you call that? No. Uh, Accountability? No. Uh, is that the right word? No. Or liability, maybe? Not even reputation. Um, mm. No skin in the game, basically. No <laughs> skin in the game, exactly. Yeah. 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 Fascinating, fascinating. So but let's let's swing the conversation to to one of the the big projects that you've been working on for many many years now, mm. um, and that's that's Join Market, of course. Mm. Uh, so how did or why did you get curious mm. into using and contributing to Join Market? What made mm. that project so special for you? Yeah. Okay. So after TLS Notary, I did a little bit of playing around with like multi-c but it was mostly just investigation and trying to get a better understanding of how bitcoin works and how bitcoin you know transaction programming works and stuff so i was playing around with multi-sig and uh that's when i met uh, chris belcher who was seemed to be doing pretty much the same thing as me in other words playing around with multi-sig and trying to understand better how, how wallets work and so on um and at some point he um I remember we played around with some like he had a, a idea of like a, a manual coin join tool. Uh, I think he called it Coin Jumble, and we 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 were sort of experimenting with that. And why Coin Join? Well, it was one of a few different things that at the end of 2013 were being sort of discussed as as somewhat semi hot topics as like things you could do with Bitcoin. Um, Obviously, multisig was another, but that that had come before, somewhat before 2013. Um, but there was also Coin Swap, and this was like two or three posts that uh, Greg Maxwell made on on Bitcoin Talk, where he was trying to 
you know, give some detail and some explanation of of uh, how you could address the fungibility issue of using Bitcoin practically. And I think uh, myself and Chris Belcher were not the only ones who were very interested in these topics. I mean, if you remember, you probably do, the Dark Wallet kind of picked up the idea of CoinJoin pretty much immediately. And they already had somewhat working software by, I don't know, I want to say end of 2013, early 2014. Um, so, so yeah, by, by, but if we get on to like end of 2014, uh, we've been playing around with various tools like this and doing other stuff. And Chris Belch came up with the idea of specific, the idea of a, a market for coin joins. Uh, I think it must have been like November 2014. He, he could probably remember the exact date and we're discussing it on IRC. And I do remember, I do remember as soon as he mentioned the idea, I was immediately like, yes, that will work. Um, and I, and I hadn't, there were other projects I was kind of like half interested in, but I wasn't really so sure. And that one is like, yeah, that works. That actually makes sense. Um, you know, it might have problems, but clearly people will use it. So, so he, well, uh, go on. Yeah. Let me a question to that because so I think the reason why you guys came up with this market mechanism was to incentivize liquidity. Yeah. Um, but. Maybe now in hindsight, do you even think that the liquidity question is an earnest one or, or in, uh, like an important one to focus on? Uh, because, I mean, you know, just because you get better privacy might be enough of a reason to provide liquidity, even without getting paid. Oh, so be, it seems like you're saying two different things there. On the one hand, you're talking about liquidity, but also you're talking about the incentive, like whether there's a financial incentive uh, to create, to provide liquidity, yeah? Um... I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, it's it's just a, a mixture of incentives together, isn't it? And um, it might be the case that today, and indeed it does seem to be the case, that the overall like equation that a person uh, makes in their mind when they consider providing liquidity uh, ends up being more pushed by a, a privacy desire than by uh, a gain, like a, a monetary gain desire. Um, but I think that's kind of a slightly confused way of looking at it. I, a lot of people do look at it like that, but I think it's slightly confused because the point to me is that there's a significant cost in engaging in uh, these kinds of uh, randomly uh, arranged coin joins. Um, what, what I, all I'm trying to say is that you have to like add together the various different costs or uh, costs and benefits, right? So there's the uh, Bitcoin network transaction fee cost. There's the privacy benefit. There's the uh, speed of speed of uh, liquidity um, benefit, which you get you can get as a taker, which you don't get as a maker. And there's the uh, specific amount benefit, which is very useful for avoiding change outputs, which you can get as a taker. And there's and so on. There's the convenience. There's the passivity benefit of not having to do anything. And you know, there's many different benefits and costs to to add up together. And this one of oh setting a price, it just gives it like another free variable, right? So actually, it turns out that at very small, um, very small sizes of Bitcoin coin join amounts, uh, there doesn't seem to be really any meaningful uh, price demanded by by the the makers. Uh, it's some nominal amount, right? But I, I would guess uh, I haven't looked at the stats recently, but it has tended to be the case in the past that at much larger amounts. Where liquidity is scarcer, then there is more of a uh, like a income, an actual income from providing that liquidity because it's more of a scarce resource. But you still have to add up together all these different costs and benefits as well. So it's it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's definitely fascinating to put like a, an actual market price into this equation, right? Mm. Because well, what is the perceived value of the privacy? Right, that's that's yeah. a very fishy number to quantify. Um, yeah, very well, how many cents are the uh, taker actually paying the makers? Mm. And that's something really tangible um, mm. and and really really fascinating. Yeah, but you should, um, but yeah, um, you should con include the the network fee uh, sort of yeah. element. It's otherwise, it, it, if you don't consider that element of it, I think you you tend to get a, a rather skewed picture. Um, yeah, but I was actually thinking about this recently. Um, mm. 
for me, I think the network fee is mm. uh, negligible in coin joins um, because um, how can I explain this? Um, like a coin join user is automatically a Bitcoin transaction maker, mm. right? So uh, any Bitcoin transaction maker already considers the the fee um, for this, um, and there's not necessarily like an an added um, or like the, it it quote unquote doesn't matter how expensive the on chain fee is because there will always be um, uh, like on chain transactions being made right especially mm -hmm. in a high fee environment there are many mm -hmm. on chain transactions being made yeah and now if there is a desire for privacy on chain mm -hmm. then the coin join cost is uh, is or the transaction fee is is negligible right because the the user is already willing to make the transaction. Um, and now just on top of the existing transaction, he wants to make a coin join. I mean, doesn't that depend on whether the coin join is uh, part of a like explicit mixing process or whether the coin join involves paying? I, I don't really understand how that would be true unless you're talking about the case where you make a payment directly in a coin join to a third party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good that you point that out. Um, that's important, right? If you already make a payment, Mm. Then doing that payment inside a coin join. Yes, absolutely. Uh, of clear, clear. Clear. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then if you, if you mix to yourself, for example, yeah. Yeah, uh, which just is... to get that privacy benefit, yeah. then yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah. The mining fees are again important. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a good, uh, yes, it's another, it's another way in which the situation is, is complicated. But, uh, yeah, the general principle that, that he came up with, that Chris Belcher came up with of well, there's, there's a fee, I think is a good one. It's a good example of like, I mean, clearly, you, you can immediately point out three or four things about the idea that that are, you know, problematic. But it doesn't mean that it isn't a good idea. Still, you know, it it, it has a value. Um, and what I liked about the approach he took in terms of designing it was that it wasn't um, too pie in the sky with a lot of very advanced bells and whistles. It was just here's a very like concrete understandable set of plumbing i mean originally it was just like a set of like four or five scripts you know with it with a few extra modules here and there but here's a concrete set of steps that you can take and you can actually do this and yeah there are limitations but what's nice is that you can trade off the limitations a lot at least you can trade off a lot of the limitations you can say to yourself all right i'm really interested in principally in just pushing coins through uh you know several coin joins so so he focused on things like making sure there weren't obvious amount correlations. He focused on making sure there weren't obvious timing correlations from the point of view of this person who is actively trying to mix. And uh, and he made the it made it so that yeah there there are there, there are like change outputs, but we we ensure that we know what's going on in the sense that we we isolate the coin join outputs from the change outputs. Uh, and we make, like make the wallet structure to support that, and um, you know the the, the fees uh, at the time when it was created, the Bitcoin transaction fees were just like just uninteresting. So we we just like stuck in a completely um, fixed fee of like ten thousand satoshis because it was just like we didn't care. But <laughs> that ended up taking up probably hundreds of hours of development over the over the years, just because we had to keep like finessing and finessing on the transaction fees to make sure that it was working properly but um but yeah it was just very practical you know that was i think that, that that's the main point it was it was focused on practicality and my my initial contribution was i said okay uh, I, this is great so my contribution is i'll just give you a encrypted messaging layer and i just just got the you know pretty much bog standard libsodium um end-to-end -end encrypted messaging stuff and i just kind of folded it in so that at least everything apart from the things which have to be public because in the nature of join market is that it being a market it has to be open in terms of at making advertisements but the other stuff namely the the data being transferred for the transactions is all sort of hidden under encryption so it's it's end-to-end -end encrypted of course not just not just something crappy like encrypted to the server that would that would not work. Uh, so it's the two parties negotiate a specific encryption key for that, and so on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. That that in encryption layer is very important, and um, you know, it, it's I understand it. It's it's still run all through IRC servers. Right? Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah, there's 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 multiple IRC servers. Con- um, what's the word? Configured, but it's a, it's a painful point because even recently we've been you know, having discussions about finding ways. The, uh, the what, one of the problems is that we see. I, I put a lot of effort into this back in I don't know early 2017 or late 2016. Put a lot of effort into um, saying, you know what, we don't necessarily want this. Uh, messaging layer we can we can use other ones so I, i've made the code such that we could use multiple other uh, messaging layers at the same time or, or just different ones but unfortunately it's a painful point that neither myself nor anyone else could could somehow find either the will or the way <laughs> to actually make that happen yet uh, we've even got to the point where we're now discussing like or well, maybe every client has its own hidden service uh, but there's i mean we've got a lot of the code in place to do that but there's there's some there's some difficulties with having just a very pure peer-to-peer layer with a with a piece of software like Join Market. It's not it doesn't to me it doesn't quite fit. Although maybe we could make it work. It's tricky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I th- and I think one of the biggest innovations and and really groundbreaking strengths of Join Market um, is a well decentralized discovery process. Mm-hmm. Of finding the centralized coordinator, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah. think that's that's very very interesting because well, fundamentally, uh, or there most coin join protocols out there are centrally coordinated because it's much easier to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but, I'm not even sure that's true anymore. I mean, they ha- historically perhaps, but apart from join market is the only one who has, uh, isn't it? We're, we're only looking at what are we looking at? We're looking at a, a samurai and wasabi and. And join market. Is there any others, or am I, am I forgetting? Um, all of these are centrally coordinated, right? Um, uh, are... But I wouldn't say that Wasabi and um, Samurai. I'm not sure, uh, but let's just talk about Wasabi. I wouldn't really call it centrally coordinated because you don't learn the linkages, right? Oh, oh, yeah. No, okay. That, that, that's that's an interesting point that I want to hone out here because yeah. Um, I mean. What I mean by a central coordinator is just mm. that there's one person that receives the messages and sends right. them out to everyone, right? It's, yeah. it's not something like Coin Shuffle or Coin Shuffle Plus Plus. Right. Where everyone talks to yeah. everyone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, it's, there's this, the central coordination pro- uh, process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and now there are some, some nuances here because in, in Join Market, for every transaction or for every coin join, there's one taker who coordinates the round yeah. and many makers. Who yeah. will take part in the round? Yeah. Um, and for me, that I was always thinking because coin joins try to increase the anonymity set size. Mm. Right? You, you try to hide in the crowd. Mm. And if you're a maker, well, mm. then you have five, eight, twelve uh, other makers in this coin join that mm. have the exact same, you know, um, kind of task or the exact same setup uh, in in the architecture. They're all makers. Right? Mm. But there's only one taker. There's mm. only one person who can, uh, you know, make a sweep, for example, mm-hmm. yeah. or, or set the equal amount and such. Um, and yeah. do you think that this is like a, a, a hindrance or, or a reduction in the anonymity set for the taker specifically? Because he's the only one taker in the round. Yeah, I think so. Um, it, when you put it like that, it's certainly true um, that there's, uh, yeah, and so so this leads to like if you have certain patterns of behavior, uh, you can say, oh, that's the taker, and then there's another join, and that's the taker, and that's the, and you can sort of deduce, oh, that's the same guy. Um, so I think that's true, which is why, uh, which is why I would say two things. On the one hand, uh, the the strength, <laughs> it it suddenly reminds me of like this Adam Smith quote, like, uh, what is it? The the division of labor is a is affected by the the size of the market or something there's some sense in which uh, a system like this works a lot better with a lot a lot of people acting in parallel so there's that element and if you just have one taker coming on let's say today there's just one taker and there's 100 of make, different makers then it's kind of not going to be too hard to to identify uh you know if, if you do a lot of activity in that one day obviously you're going the, the takers actions are going to be pretty you know, i don't want to overstate this but pretty easy to um uh, disentangle so there's that aspect but there's, then there's also the other aspect which is the the mixing of roles because i think it's certainly true if let's say there are 10 takers in the world and there are 500 or 100 
makers in the world and those two sets are not overlapping and never changing, then again, although it will depend on the, the specific details of the transactions, generally speaking, it's going to make the system quite ineffective um, or less effective anyway, uh, creating any kind of anonymity set between the two sets, yeah, which is kind of what the point you're getting at is that the the anonymity sets um, have might have naturally have a tendency to be distinct, and we don't want that. We want the anonymity sets all to sort of merge together. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a valid critique of the general approach of join market, which is that it doesn't address the taker maker asymmetry in and of itself, unless you know certain other things happen. So yeah, yeah, but I actually like your counter argument that you have to look at it not just for one transactions where it's true mm. there's only one taker, but you have mm. to look at the whole transaction graph. Yeah, there are potentially hundreds of takers. Yeah, and so so that that is indeed actually a, a well an increase in the anonymity set. Um, yeah, but then I I guess the most substantial way to quote unquote fix that uh, is to alternate the roles, right? Do some yeah. roles as a maker, some roles mm. as a taker. Yeah, and then you kind of inherit the anonymity set. Of both the maker graph and the taker graph. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I consider that to be the sort of royal road. That's that's the, the in quotes correct way to use join market is to is that is to run a maker like by default if that's easy for you to do. But of course, you know, it depends on the personal circumstances and using the taker for individual payments, uh, using the taker periodically for specific uh, like chunks of money that you want to like plunge a bit deeper into <laughs> you want to take that because it's like very closely connected to an exchange perhaps and you just want to plunge it a bit deeper into the anonymity set so you you, you do a round of, of of tumblr or something like that for a few days or something and then just see the odd, odd odd you know transaction here and there and you know we have other features now you can you can also do pay joins with it so or at least if it's working <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 no no absolutely join market has advanced uh, quite a lot um, and, and one of the use cases that it has, I'm actually not sure when that was implemented, mm. but is that it's that both the maker and the taker mm. um, can make a payment inside mm -hmm. the coin join. I think that's that's wait 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 who said who's wh 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 who told you that's possible? Uh, how is that possible? Well, Let me think. The 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 taker can make uh, well he he can make a payment inside the equal amount of a coin join. Right, so if he wants to make a payment 0 0.1234 Bitcoin, then yeah. he tells the makers to create a coin join with 0 0.1234. Oh yeah, yeah, Bitcoin. oh yeah. That's that's mm -hmm. the most probably the most fundamental like claim mm -hmm. of of what Chris Belcher was trying to achieve was he was just saying, look, well, equal denomination is a problem, and the way to solve it is with a, a market, and therefore, like you said, uh, the taker can make a payment of us, make a payment to a third party. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but this is also true, well, to a, a less private extent, quote unquote, for the maker, because he can put m many change outputs uh, into the coin join. Right? He's not just limited to two, one standard amount and one change. I think no, he, he, change. no, he is limited to two, unless somebody's written a patch. It's a nice idea, but we haven't done it. Uh, let me think about that. So, if we had, if the maker wanted to have more than one output, I mean, that's not how we do it right now. It's possible. Oh, okay. Well, then I then I was uh, mistaken in thinking that. That's a good idea. Let me think about that. Is it, is there a negative? I mean, the the positive idea of that is very clear, right? Because it means that a maker can make a payment, but he would have to like, yeah, that would require some 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 code, but it's not difficult code. Okay, but is there a negative there? Because it does separately. I well, you always have that problem whenever you change any aspect of an algorithm is that you're going to be creating a fingerprint of a new type of mm -hmm. thing. But I'm not sure that that's a very negative thing, really. Um, and it would make the maker's life... If, and a request that we have had, which is slightly different from what you said, I think somebody opened this as an issue a few weeks ago, is can they basically kind of drain out from their wallet through coin joins by having the, each change address for each coin join is from another wallet, like give an XPUB and then just drain it out that's a nice idea as well again it hasn't been done yet mm -hmm. um but your idea is, is is more powerful is there some negative with it i don't think so um mm. i have i mean for one the taker knows the link uh between the maker's inputs and outputs, yeah. 
Right? True. So that's existing. So that's, that's existing, yeah. Yeah. Well, one potential upside, although it's probably a small one, is that subset sum analysis on the change will get more complex. No, no, it wouldn't. Why? No, it wouldn't. Oh, more complex. You just mean slight because there's slightly more slightly. numbers to deal with. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, that's slight positive. I agree. Yeah, definitely. But uh, oh, actually, maybe one of the downsides is that it takes away one of the big benefits that the taker has over the maker, and one of the kind of privileges that the taker oh. has. Oh, right. To be able. I mean, to that's obviously it. in a way that's silly, but that's actually it's also a very good point. Yeah. Um, Huh. Yeah, then the question is, will makers even run the taker role? Oh, hang on. Why, why, if why they can does, make the payments already? Uh, hang on a minute. Why, why is this not already a, a consideration in any arbitrary uh, coin join implementation like uh, Wasabi? Like when we say to Wasabi people, oh, but in join market, you can do a, you can do a payment of a fixed amount. Then why don't you just re retort, well, we can do that as well. We just split the amounts mm -hmm. up. But they have to be smaller than the fixed size, right? Oh, no, they don't. Hang on. Not for the maker. Huh. Mm, no, they just have to be smaller than the change that you get. Right? Yeah, the smaller the change you get, exactly. Yeah. So what Wasabi can already do is to put a wallet external address uh, uh -huh. in the output of a coin join. Mm -hmm. That's pretty buggy, though, actually. Uh -huh. um, but it works in the daemon. Um, Interesting. And we did go down that line of thinking for splitting up the change for a payment. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhat combining that with knapsack mixing to actually have mm. some solid uh, uh, probabilistic privacy. Um, yeah, but it's it's something very interesting because, or just to get a st step one back and mm. speak why this is so important generally, um, for one, uh, like, you can now have an output in a coin join without having an input, right? And this actually gives you plausible deniability of being the signer in that input, in that coin join, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, specifically, if an exchange starts censoring you because you are spending a coin join output to them, hmm. now you can. Say, oh, hey, you I can say no. I didn't even have an input. I okay. just believe that someone else paid me this. Okay, I've just I've just remembered, or I've just realized that the the real the real counter argument to your idea. Your idea of the maker making payments of fixed amounts as part of his change and like separating his change outputs into two, in theory, is clearly a very, very good idea. But I think in practice, it's not actually that useful. And the reason is that the almost every scenario, and obviously not every scenario, but almost every scenario in which you care about making a payment, you also care about the timing. The only exception is when you're moving funds into cold storage or something, in which case, why not just move all of it? I, or there might be some special cases, but if you're, if I'm making a payment on a website, I can't wait four days for the next coin join to turn up. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, there are two aspects to the timing. One is the, the finality until the coin join ceremony is done and the coin mm. join is signed and broadcasted. Yeah. Um, um, because if that takes four days, then the transaction is not even in the mempool and not even, like, nobody will see it. Yeah. Um, and then the second is, when does it actually confirm? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's also true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But I think, in, I think in practice, at least, yeah, I think realistically, it's not, it's a sort, it's a sort of add on feature that will be useful occasionally instead of being like an absolutely mind blowing, brilliant add on mm -hmm. feature. And I think this is this is quite. I think if you had Chris Beltron rather than me, he would have he would have picked that point up quicker because he was always very strong on this point. He was trying to like really explain to you we've got fundamentally a coordination problem here, and the reason that we, we need a market and the reason we needs like an incentive mechanism is because this the, the the actual quality the value of being able to make a payment of a specific amount at a specific time is the thing that users actually want and need. And and that's what you're getting out of using this from the taker side that you just don't get otherwise with, with CoinJoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's a really really good observation. Um, absolutely. Um, I but I was also thinking this from the context of a low time preference transaction batching. Mm -hmm. um, so think of it that mentally you have a queue of transactions that you want yeah. to make or of payments that you want to yeah. make in the future. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, like up till the thirtieth of the month. I gotta pay my rent, right? Yeah. And then the wallet might figure, or you can tell the wallet from now up until the 30th, figure the best, like the cheapest and the most private, um, time to yeah. make that payment. Right? Yeah. 
And let's say if throughout the time mempool fees are extremely high and there was no coin join liquidity, mm -hmm. uh, then when the time limit is reached, make mm. a naive single user. Uh, transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, like I said, there, there's definitely going to be scenarios where you could describe that where this could be useful. But I think as a general rule, payments, people don't want to make payments in that low time preference way. They want to make <laughs> payments kind of as soon as possible. Almost in every case, the only they, there are minor exceptions, but but not 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 usually. So mm -hmm. I I would again describe it as a cool add-on feature, and it does have a number of other benefits, as you say, in terms just just simple silly things like as you say, it will be one more output, meaning that the subset sum would be that but much more difficult. That's that's a small change, but there's other. In but yeah, definitely. Both that one and the other one of just like having an X pub to drain out, which is kind of almost the same idea. Having an X pub that you drain out the change into another wallet, also a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I like the idea of having a custom change address. Uh, always, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, that's quite smart. Like you can spend yeah. from your hardware wallet and set the custom change address to be directly your join market wallet. Oh, all right. Back into coin join. Right? The same same principle the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. It, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, Adam, we we uh, spoke about a bunch uh, and fell down many different rabbit holes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, do you have any blazing topics that you still have in mind that you want to share with the Wasabi class here? Uh, not really. I um, I'm toying with the idea of writing a a blog post about Musig too because um, because I think. Uh, I'm guessing most people don't understand it, so, and, I, and I want to understand it a bit better too. So I'm going to try and probably do that in the next few days. Um, so look out for that. <laughs> but apart from that, not really. No. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so, uh, again, I can very much recommend Waxwing's blog about all things cryptography and Schnorr and Taproot and, and music. Uh, very like it's it's uh, it's how do you it's challenging to read, but in a good sense. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah. It tends to be very dense. I know my writing style tends to be a bit, bit too dense, but I, I, I can't help it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and dense and long, right? And that's a yeah. dangerous combination. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem. The subjects are so that they are. They're just intrinsically like that. But anyway, yeah. But I also wrote a blog post about proof of work where I put a lot of pictures, so you can you can look at that instead if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and memes too. No, not memes, unfortunately. Just, just pictures. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> well, then they're mean. I mean, all pictures can be memes, can't they? If if it resonates with you. But uh, yeah, are all memes pictures? No, clearly not. Yeah. <laughs> but all pictures can be memes. <laughs> <laughs> they can. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Adam, thank you so much for coming on. That was a thank you. fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Thanks. Okay, and uh, see you on the next show. What was it? Was a Bye bye.